In part one of this Statistics Made Easy series, we looked at some different types of data. Here in part two, we will be taking things to the next level and looking at distributions. A distribution is simply a way to understand how a group of data points is spread out over a range of values. And while distributions can be applied to both discrete and continuous numeric data, and we'll cover many of those types in one of the upcoming videos of this series, in this video, we will be introducing a distribution with respect to some continuous data. In part one, we were playing the part of sportswear company Nike, and we discussed that one of our sponsored athletes, LeBron James, was 2.06 meters tall. And while generally speaking, we would consider this to be very tall, we were curious as to how LeBron's height compared to all players in the NBA. Now, there are about 450 players currently playing in the NBA, and if we knew the heights of all of those players, we could plot the distribution of those heights on a chart like this. This distribution specifically shows the spread of player heights along the x-axis, ranging between shorter players on the left to taller players on the right. And now we know that the x-axis is representing the range of player heights, what about the y-axis? What is that measuring? Well, you can essentially think of this in two ways. First, the number of players in the NBA that would be at each of those heights across the spectrum, or we can think of this as a probability value. And in our specific case here, let's think of the y-axis as representing the likelihood of any randomly selected player from the population or sample being of height x. Let's put this in real terms. Let's say that the average or mean height across all 450 NBA players was 200 centimeters or two meters. If we were to pick one of those 450 players at random, we can see from this chart that there is a much higher likelihood of us picking a player who is somewhere around this mean height than there is of us picking a player near the extremes, as these players are far more rare within the population of NBA players. And this is the same when we're walking down the street, for example, we see a lot of people who are around average height and far fewer people who are very tall or very short. Of course, the population of NBA players is much taller on average than the total population, but the principle remains the same. And this idea that we can essentially plug in height values and get a likelihood for that value from the sample or population in return is often referred to as the probability density function. And in more real terms, this is what defines the shape of our distribution. So whether our curved line there is taller and skinnier, or in other words, there is a higher proportion or higher density of players near the mean height, or conversely, if it is wider and flatter, which would tell us that the heights of players in our sample or population are more evenly spread from short to tall. And this idea of the spread of the data is something that we'll talk about in more specific terms in a moment. For now, let's head back to the distribution that we had originally, and let's talk more about distributions like this one in general. Now, a curve or distribution like the one we see here I'm sure you've seen it many times before, and it's often known as a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. Sometimes it's just called a bell-shaped curve. And to build more on what we've spoken about so far, distributions like this really only have two key parts that describe them. They have a mean, and that could be anything depending on what we're measuring. In our example, this was the average height of an NBA player, and we said that this was equal to 200 centimeters. The other thing that makes up a normal distribution is something called standard deviation. We will talk about this more in a moment, but as a nice high level overview, standard deviation is simply a metric that measures the amount of variation contained within a set of data. And when talking about the standard deviation for a distribution, a lower standard deviation tells us that the values in the set tend to be pretty close to the mean. And this is what we saw earlier with a taller, skinnier curve. Conversely, a higher standard deviation value for a distribution indicates that the set of values in our sample or population are spread more broadly. And again, we saw this earlier with a flatter curve. Now, something that is really important to understand is how to calculate standard deviation. And to do that, you use this formula here, which can look a bit scary the first time you see it, or if you've not encountered it in a few years, but it's all very intuitive when we break it down bit by bit. So let's do that now. So this part here, tells us to take the overall mean for the set, and this is denoted by the X with the line on top of it, to take that overall mean 
away from each individual value in the set and then to square the result. Now we will run through an actual example of this step by step in a moment, but to set this all up, if we had say five values in our set, this part of the formula is telling us to first calculate the overall mean for those five values. Then we'd take this mean value away from each of the five individual values in our set. And the reason that we do this is because this tells us how far away each of our values is from the overall mean. In other words, it tells us if each of our values is close or similar to the mean, or if it's quite a distance from the mean. Each time we do take the mean away from one of our values, I mentioned that we square the result. And the reason for this is to ensure that we make all of these differences between the value and the mean positive. If we didn't do this, we'd have a mix of negative differences where the mean was less than the data point value and positive differences where the mean was greater than the data point value. When we sum all of these differences up in the next step of this process to get an idea of the total variation in our set, we'd end up cancelling them all out, giving a measure of the total spread somewhere near zero, where in reality the true spread of the set was large. It just happened that some values were larger than the mean and some values values were less than the mean. Our overall objective here is to describe the spread of the data. When calculating standard deviation, we don't actually care if the difference between the value and the mean was positive or negative, we're more concerned with the difference itself. So back to the equation on screen, and as I just mentioned, the next step is to add up or sum up all of those squared differences that we've just calculated, giving us a value that tells us the total squared deviation for our set of data. Once we have this, the next step is to divide this by the number of data points in the set minus one, which will give us the average deviation per value rather than the total deviation. Intuitively, you'd think we'd just divide by the number of data points, but here I'm saying that we should divide by the number of data points minus one. Why? Well, without going into too much detail here, this essentially comes down to whether we're measuring a population mean where we have all of the data or a sample mean. In most cases, we don't actually know the true population mean and we'll be working with a sample. So statistically speaking, using n minus one takes this into account. In our example here, you could argue that we do have the full population of NBA players, but I really wanted to cover this point here as it's something you will come across and it might cause you confusion as it does seem a little bit strange. Anyway, after we have our average deviation per value, we then take the square root of that to reverse the squaring that we did earlier. We needed to do this squaring initially in order to ensure all deviation values were positive, but this also results in the deviation values being very large. Taking the square root means that we bring the deviation values back to being based on true deviation distance from the mean. So that is an overview of the parts of the standard deviation formula itself. Let's now go one better and run through a really simple example to show it all in action. Let's say that we had a sample of data that contained several values and you can see those on the left of screen there, the values of one, two, three, four, and five. Our sample has five values in it and thus n in this case, which we'll need for our formula and which represents the number of values in the sample is equal to five. The next thing that we need for our formula is to calculate the mean of our values. So if we add them up, so one plus two plus three plus four plus five, we get 15. And if we divide this by n equals five, we get a mean of three. And now we have n and we have our sample mean, we can start running through the steps of the formula. And if you remember, the very first step was to subtract the mean from each of our sample values and then square the result. So if we took the mean away from each of our values, we would get these values here in the second column of our table. So running down row by row, our first value of one minus the overall mean of three equals negative two. On the next row, two minus the mean of three equals negative one. On the third row, three minus three equals zero and so on. Once we've taken away the mean, the next step was to square those values to ensure that they are all positive. And in our example, this would result in these values here in the third column. And again, just to be super clear, this third column is showing each of the values in that middle column squared. So negative two squared is four, negative one squared is one, zero squared is zero, and so on. 
Once we've done that, the next step in the formula was to sum those squared values up. So back to our table of data, that would be the sum of that third column. So four plus one plus zero plus one plus four, which equals 10. And this represents the total squared deviation of our data. From here, the next step in our formula was to take this total deviation and move it to a mean or average deviation for the sample, or what is often just referred to as the variance. As this is a sample of data, to do this as per our formula, we want to divide our total squared deviation value of 10 by n, our sample size of five, minus one, so four. 10 divided by four gives us a mean squared deviation or variance value of 2.5. From here, the last part of our formula tells us to take the square root of this number. And thus, the standard deviation of our sample is the square root of 2.5, which is equal to 1.581. So we can now say that our sample of data here has a mean of three and a standard deviation of 1.581. And while this is a super simple example, hopefully it ensures that we're all on the same page before we progress into slightly more advanced applications. So let's do it. With all of this in mind, let's go and apply it to our NBA distribution, where we said that the mean height was 200 centimeters. Without knowing anything else, if we know this is a normal distribution, because normal distributions are symmetrical, we can say that 50% of players will be shorter than the mean and 50% will be taller. But with a normal distribution, we can take this understanding of player heights much further. Let's say that we know the standard deviation of these heights is seven centimeters. This extra knowledge gives us much more information than we had when we just knew the mean. If we assume that the data is indeed normally distributed, then we can start to understand what proportion of players will be between or above and below certain heights. We can even start to understand how rare or special a particular height might be. In other words, for a given player, what proportion of other players might have a height as extreme as theirs. And we can do this because the probability density function for a normal distribution tells us that around 68% of observations should lie between one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean. And we have everything we need to calculate what those values are. Since we know that the mean is 200 centimeters, these two values, the ones denoted by the dotted lines on screen, would be 200 centimeters minus the standard deviation of seven centimeters and 200 centimeters plus the standard deviation of seven centimeters. So we can say, according to this distribution at least, 68% of players in the NBA are between 193 centimeters and 207 centimeters. And remember this 68%, it isn't a magical number. It's purely that of the area contained under our whole distribution curve, 68% of that area is within the dotted lines you see here. And that is exactly what the probability density function is based upon. And because of this, it provides us the function to create the curve where these statistics are true. If we were to extend out our dotted lines further to the left and to the right, so to points on the chart that were two standard deviations above and below the mean, this would now represent 95.5% of players, or in other words, approximately 95.5% of players in the NBA are between 186 centimeters and 214 centimeters. Again, we can extend this further to three standard deviations from the mean. And at these points, the area in between is capturing around 99.7% of all observations. Generally speaking, anything with a standard deviation that is greater than three is considered to be pretty rare or pretty extreme. A player in the NBA would need to be less than 179 centimeters or over 221 centimeters to fall outside these boundaries. How amazing are distributions? They are such a powerful way to showcase and understand our data. And trust me, we are just getting started. In this video, we've been showing the heights of players that would exist at one, two, and three standard deviations from the mean. But what if we wanted to analyze a specific case? What if we wanted to know how many standard deviations LeBron James at 206 centimeters was from the mean? 
Because if we knew that, we can figure out all sorts of other interesting things. One of those being the proportion of players in the NBA that are as tall or taller than him. And that is exactly what we will look at in part three of this series. I cannot wait for this. I will see you there.